Okay, so um, I hope that everybody can hear me and that everybody can see these slides. I just want to say hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to this third of our After Hours webinar series put on by Doctors for the Environment Australia. Um, my name is Kate Wiley, I'm a GP, and it's um, my privilege and pleasure to be presenting this webinar tonight. Um, for those that don't know, Doctors for the Environment are a group of doctors and medical students who volunteer their time to look after the health of our planet. People in DEA recognise that you need a healthy planet to have healthy people. And we're always working in the space of climate and health and trying to do the best we can. And this is a group of DEA members at a conference a couple of years ago. Um, before we proceed, it's very important that we acknowledge country. So the nation called Australia is stolen land. First Nations people have never ceded their sovereignty of their land and respect is owed to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island nations and First Nations people. I'm on Ghana land, um, so Ghana Earth, which is the Adelaide Plains. Um, greetings to a group of people in, in Ghana is Namani. So Namani everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, I think it's a sign of respect if you write the name of the land that you're on in the chat, um, just so we all know and realise that we're coming from all across Australia for this webinar tonight. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rosemary Stanton, who is going to be presenting on nutrition in a changing climate. I'm sure most of you have heard of her. Um, Dr. Stanton is a household name. She's been active in the nutrition and health space for a number of decades now, um, is a celebrated author, been on many, um, written many, many articles, um, lots of books and research things. And um, I think it's, I'm very privileged that she's agreed to come along and talk to us tonight. You know, thank you very much, Rosemary. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and allow Rosemary to start sharing hers. Um, she'll be um, presenting for about half an hour and then after she's presented, we'll have time for questions and answers and, um, you know, just sort of get some questions from the floor. All right, whenever you're ready, Rosemary, thank you. Right. Now, I'm just having a slight difficulty here. Ah, is that right? That's right for me. Is it right for you? That's great. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to come and talk about what is um, a very favourite topic of mine and has been for, for really quite a few years. I, you were very kind and said I've been around for a few decades. I think we're up to um, 40, 54 or 55 years of <laughs> working in this business. And I've been interested in environmental things for about 30 of those years. So uh, hence my, my interest in this whole topic. Mm. It's, it's an area where we do have some problems. We know the world population is increasing. We also know that current diets are far from ideal in Australia for one reason, in other countries for other reasons. And we also are very aware that production of some foods creates far more greenhouse gases than others. These are just sort of some of the facts we have. They, these are global problems and they do require global solutions and what may be appropriate in one area may not be totally appropriate in another. So we just need to keep that in, in mind as we go through it. The immediate problems that we have in the world are that almost a billion people are hungry and we have tw about twice as many who actually eat too much and who choose the sort of foods that contribute to excessive greenhouse gases but also increase the risk of a lot of the non-communicable diseases. So we have a, a number of problems that actually go together. And I think if we can keep that in mind throughout, it's quite useful. By 2050, uh, we have this sort of problem, the, the, this idea that the environmental effects of the food system are going to increase dramatically. Now, this was a prediction made in 2018 uh, by some experts. And they said it will, will vary in different parts of the world, but it's going to be a problem unless we can get appropriate technologi technological changes and we can get people to, to, take, to do things and we can reach levels that are beyond the planetary boundaries that define a safe operating space for humanity. So it's a, it's a bit of a, a summary, I suppose, of what we're going to need to talk about. To go back to the more mundane areas, our current diets are not nutritionally optimal. Um, in Australia, of course, we have, they're very high in ultra-processed foods. 
most of which you'd classify as junk foods. Now, if you don't know what an ultra processed food is, a rough definition is that these are foods that contain things that you would never find in any kitchen anywhere in the world. So they might be preservatives and colorings and all sorts of additives, but they enable foods to be produced and processed in such a way that uh, you minimize the real ingredients and you have um, basically a heap of junk. Our diets in Australia certainly lack sufficient plant foods, and that includes vegetables as well as legumes, which are things like the chickpeas and lentils and all those sorts of things, and nuts and fruits and whole grains, all in insufficient quantities. We also have an inequitable distribution of animal foods. So we have some people who have lots of animal foods, and this is perhaps a global problem more than a problem uh, in Australia, though it is still a problem in certain areas. And our current diets are, are a major contributor to climate change. The other thing that we mustn't lose sight of is that we are increasingly eroding natural biodiversity. Now we often have people who say, look, we've got vast areas in the north of Australia where we can have cattle, but in doing that, they wipe out a lot of the, the native animals, the native plants. And so that with, this is sort of eroding um, biodiversity when of course we have that in much more in areas around like the Murray Darling Basin as, as well. Yeah. So some of the sustainability issues of food, if we can just run through them quickly, agriculture occupies about 40% of, of land throughout the world. And food production is responsible for varying amounts of greenhouse gas production, but somewhere between a third, about a third, and about 70% of freshwater use. So it's really quite significant. And the land that's used for food production is the single most important driver of biodiversity loss. So we have to remember that too. The other thing is that we waste huge amounts of foods. This decreases our resources, reduces resources. And of course, it further increases greenhouse gases because as those foods rot, they produce methane, which of course is a very potent greenhouse gas. I've got some um, references here. I'm quite happy for anyone to have copies of all of this and, and to look up some of these references. This was a very a new one that just came out on food systems and, and their responsibility for, uh, for global greenhouse gas, gas emissions. That might be something you might like to look at. Yeah. The issues that we need to look at when they relate to food, are first of all, land use, secondly, nutrition and health. And I also want to talk a little bit about waste and packaging because they really are important. So changing land use for food, we need to decrease land clearing, obviously. Um, we need to reduce animal products and some animal products need to be reduced much more than others. And particularly lot feeding. Lot feeding is really quite absurd. Now, I know people say it's good, you feed, you, you produce grains and legumes, you feed them to the animals and those, that meat will have, uh, that the animal will grow faster, it'll have a lower content of, of fat and higher content of protein, so that's a good thing. But if you look at the total picture, it's really not a good thing at all because it is totally absurd. It's horrible for the animals for a start. Um, but then you have their manure and you have the crops being grown somewhere and transported somewhere else. So it really is quite absurd. And of course, it applies to some animals much more than others. We also need to increase crop yields. And that's really quite important. Uh, and CSIRO and others in Australia are working on that. And throughout the world, people are, are looking at that. And we need to favour healthy crops. I mean, using our land to grow stuff to produce junk food really doesn't make sense. And you also have to look at suitable locations. I live in an area of New South Wales, a, a rural area. Um, I actually live on a mountain and there's above a daring valley. We get lots of rain. Uh, they don't need to bring in anything else except sort of the, there's plenty of grass for the cows there. That's probably a suitable location for having some cows, whereas other areas uh, certainly aren't. But we don't want too many cows even in that area. We have to bring in food from somewhere else. Yeah. The WHO and lots of others uh, are now saying we need to bias our diets towards plant foods and fewer processed foods for both health and sustainability. And I think that sort of really sums it all up. Mm. Our group got together a couple of years ago uh, and they got together in some of the Scandinavian countries and they, they took a lot of experts from 16 countries and they took people who were specialists in health and nutrition, environmental sustainability, in agricultural and food systems and also in economic and political governance. And they got these people together. And after a couple of years, they came up with what was called the Lancet Commission. It was published in the Lancet and you can all 
you can look it up anytime you like. But it's really quite a significant uh, thing in this whole aspect of how do we get change. And I wanted to concentrate on it a little bit because every time we start talking about food and sustainability, we have the people who are for the Lancet, Lancet Commission and we have a whole lot of critics. And we perhaps, those of us who are interested in this area need to know how to answer those critics. So why did Eat Lancet get together? And they said, well, the future needs to obviously a reduction in greenhouse gases. We need a reduction in the gaps in crop yields. And so we have some parts of the world where crops yield is very poor and other parts where it's quite good. And we need to change that. We need to change uh, the fertilizers we use and particularly we need to recycle phosphorus. Now, this is very important for Australia. And I had a PhD student who who's did her PhD on this topic and it was really very interesting to look at the whole area of, of, of the way we use fertilizers in Australia. And we, we mined Christmas Island and various other places and, and, and uh, took all of the phosphorus that came from bird droppings. And we're using enormous amounts of fertilizers here. And this is because we haven't bothered to look after our soil appropriately because we had lots of fertilizer and we don't, we're not gonna have it in the future. We need to be much more efficient about water use and we need basically to shift our production priorities. So we have people who, at the moment, there's a lot of food production that goes into producing junk foods to export to Asian countries. Now, is this really very sensible? I think the answer is no. The Eat Lancet forecast said by 2050, the world population is going to be around 10 million almost. If people keep eating animal or animal foods and using up resources to produce junk foods, then we simply have no way that we can feed the, the future population. So if we're going to look at sustainable food production for everybody, we're going to require big changes. So that's why they got together. That was their rationale. The major changes they recommended were less red meat, and that would be by 50% in some areas, more legumes and nuts and fruits and vegetables, increasing them by 100% in some areas, and certainly vegetables, we'd need to do that in Australia much less added sugar and processed meats and refined grains and junk food, and much less food waste. So the major changes they recommended were that we, could, we need to look at some flexible food choices that will, will fit various types of diets within particular parameters. And the extent of what we need to change will depend on where you are. So in high income areas, uh, we need far less red meat, but there may be a need to have more red meat for women and children in low income countries. So it wasn't some, somebody saying, no, you mustn't have any meat. It was more a, a question of the quantity and the, and the appropriate distribution and wherever possible to have local production. Also, they, they put in some things that seemed a bit strange, but they were looking at people in different countries. So they said, well, it's not much use telling everyone to have olive oil if they're in areas where you can't produce olive oil, uh, for example, so that there were some different fats from sort of included in this Eat Lancet area. But the whole idea was that the increase in plant, there'd be an increase in plant foods, but the whole diet would be suitable for people who wanted to be vegetarian or vegan, or they wanted to be omnivorous and have animal foods or they wanted to be what's called flexitarian. Now, I, I think I'd probably describe myself as flexitarian um, because I, I eat very little meat, but I'm not ant totally against all meat. And I certainly have some um, seafood and, and milk and eggs and things like that. The Lancet Commission has been criticized by a lot of people saying, well, it's been funded by a very wealthy woman, and that's true, but it come, the funding came from the Wellcome Trust who supplied the financial support uh, for the actual putting together of all of this. The Children's Investment Foundation decided, said, well, look, we can contribute all the graphics and all the communications and there's little books and I've got a couple of them and lots of different um, sort of background things that people can get. And of course, the people who employed the authors uh, supplied them with money and there was no funding by food companies. This is one of the major critics that you see on social media. It was all funded by various big food companies. It wasn't, there was no funding by food companies at all. The flexibility looks at animals versus plant foods. Plant food diets are more sustainable, but we need to change our attitude to animal products. 
But I think one of the most important things and most difficult things to get across is that less doesn't necessarily mean none. Because if we start saying none and we want everyone to be vegan, it's simply not going to happen. Uh, it probably doesn't need to happen. And I don't know that it does us any good to, to sort of push that. So, we, but we do need a changing attitude. We need to stop having, we need to stop describing dinner by the, by the kind of meat. You know, people will say, what are you having for dinner? And people will say, oh, we're having, we're having chops or we're having roast beef. Or it, we need to change our, our attitude and talk about the vegetables we're having and saying there might be a bit of fish on the side or whatever. Um, now, globally, not everyone may need less and dist distribution of animal foods might, might need, obviously needs to be more equi equitable on a global scale. We certainly need to change the type of animal foods. And I've just got a list here. If we go from the most sustainable to the least sustainable in types of meat, the most sustainable type of meat is rabbit. Now, if anyone has problems with rabbits, you know, they're, they're pretty easy to breed. Um, so it is very sustainable. It happens to be a highly nutritious meat. Next comes quail, then kangaroo, then goat, then chicken, then pork, then lamb. And the least sustainable meat in most areas of the world is beef. Doesn't mean you can't have any. There may be occasions when you can have a small number of, of um, beef cattle. But if, if you're looking at the sustainability, we probably need to change our menus a little bit. When it comes to fish and seafood, there are definitely some health benefits from a couple of smallish seafood meals a week, especially if seafoods replace um, some of the less healthy foods. And there was a, a nice paper about that. But there's no health benefits for having fish seven nights a week. We have people who think they've just got to eat seafood all the time. Uh, that is not sustainable. And the type of sustainable fish varies depending on where you live. So what is appropriate in South Australia would be quite different from what uh, we would get on the south coast of New South Wales, for example. There's a very nice little uh, guide called the, the uh, goodfishbadfish.com.au. You can look up the switch, switch the Fish Guide. And the Australian Marine Conservation Society also has a guide which changes quite regularly looking at sustainable seafood. So that there's, there's a bit more action happening in looking at sustainable seafood than there has been in the case of meat. The big one in the room, of course, are the junk foods, and they not only displace more nutritious foods, but they contribute um, more than a third of the energy in the average adult diet. I've just been looking at, the, at some work I'm doing on the diet of, of um, 16 year old boys and their average consumption uh, of junk foods was about 41% of their kilojoules. So it really is quite significant. And if you look at some of the life cycle analysis that's, that's done uh, by people like Professor Sharon Friel at ANU, um, she, you can look at the fact that these foods are responsible for a lot of the water and the energy and the greenhouse gases and land use. So this does not make sense that we spend so much of our resources producing something that is worse than useless, really, certainly in the quantities in which we eat it. Mm. If we look at waste, um, about a third of all food throughout the world is, is wasted between where it's grown and when it's, when it's consumed. And the food that's wasted in the developed countries would actually be able to feed the extra 3 billion people that we're expecting by 2050. So mm. we could actually feed everybody in the world for the, the, the 10 billion people that's expected um, if we didn't waste food. So food waste is actually very important. It occurs at all stages of the food chain and just some figures that have come up in Australia, the Oz Harvest people and various, and the, uh, the environment.gov.au uh, .au have uh, regularly updated figures on how much we throw out. We throw out enormous amounts of food in households the commercial sector adds a lot. Uh, fortunately, some of the major supermarkets have started having now uh, products that are the wrong shape or the wrong size or slightly the wrong color, which they sell for, for cheaper prices. And some of the major supermarkets have them. Some of them call them ugly fruits. Some of them call them interesting fruits and vegetables. But I have been, I have spent about 40, more than 40 years trying to um, write endless letters to people uh, and try and sort of convince them that they should not say we only sell bananas that are a certain shape and size, or we shouldn't sell um, 
you know, capsicums that have got a funny, funny shape. And so that is actually having some benefit and it's very good for farmers. The farmers love it because they were just having to waste it. And there's also lots of household food waste. So if we could eliminate food waste, it would be equivalent to removing 25% of cars in our reduction of greenhouse gases. That's assuming we have petrol or diesel cars. So it really is a problem. It generates methane and that's the most powerful of all the greenhouse gases. And we could, we could use so much of the food waste and some councils, some local councils are now collecting food waste and, and using it in compost uh, also for soil enhancement, but it really, we, we could do this. This is something we can do. Packaging, I'll just briefly mention too, because about 65% of all packaging is for food. Uh, it's very useful because it improves shelf life and reduces food waste to a certain extent. It's a problem because it uses energy resources to produce and even more when it's, when it's then wasted uh, and thrown out and litter. It makes up an enormous percentage of our litter. Plastic bags are really, uh, discarded plastic bags are a huge problem, which I won't go into here, but I'm sure you're all aware of it. And as for plastic water bottles, it really is uh, totally ridiculous. In some areas, water, water in a bottle costs more than milk in a bottle, and then the, the bottles get thrown out. Now, in South, for those of you in South Australia, um, I know some of you are over there, you've been collecting uh, bottles and having deposits on bottles for a very long time. And since I worked in the health department uh, many, many years ago, I have been trying to encourage it to happen in New South Wales. And every time we have a change of government, I bombard them with lots of letters and eventually we have it. And we are now recycling bottles. And I think Victoria is about to start and that means the whole of Australia is now paying a deposit on bottles. And the reason we didn't have it was because the people producing the beverage industry did not want to do it. And they have very powerful, um, they're very powerful politically. So to address packaging, we can avoid packaged foods and drinks where we can. The best way to do that is to not buy a bottle of water. We can recycle packaging wherever possible. We can have proper recycling bins and need an education campaign to go with it. Water fountains, um, I was in Slovenia a couple of years ago and I was just amazed at the way they separate all of their rug rubbish, it's absolutely everywhere. And they have water fountains in every town that I went to anyway. And they, they have big signs up saying, please don't use plastic water bottles, bring your own container. And the water was chilled and it was really quite beautiful. And there's people just getting their water there. And I thought, oh, they, they're so far ahead of us in, their, in all of that sort of um, addressing those packaging things. And of course, it should be included in the pro product price. So all those junk foods should be have a little bit more for the recycling cost for the packaging. So the vision for a future food system, we can summarize by saying we, we need to buy only what we need. We need to have sustainable packaging. We need to have more of those plant foods, fewer junk foods. We need to use tap water, or in my case, it'd be uh, water that comes out of the tank, which comes out of the creek. Um, we need fresh, local, homegrown where possible. We need more sustainable farming, and that includes fish farming, mm -hmm. and that is actually being addressed. And we need small portions of sustainable animal foods, and wherever possible, home cooked rather than takeaway, because we're going to get much better quality food if we can home cook. One of the good things about people staying home for COVID is that they've been cooking. Now, they might have been cooking a lot of... Um, a lot more than they really needed, but at least they've sort of rediscovered that they can cook. And um, Steve Bidolf, who looks, who writes all those books about bringing up boys and says that we've now taken away so many responsibilities from young men that really he says by the age of 10, all boys should be pr producing at least one meal a week uh, for the family. And so we need to sort of teach cooking and share the cooking, because frankly, if women have to do it all the time, it becomes a terrible chore. Sorry, men watching, I'm sure most of you are really good cooks. Yes. Um, so our, our sustainable and sustaining diet, we, we need to be positive about it. I think we need to talk about how enjoyable it is, how wonderfully, you know, you can cook these sort of things. I may have a background in, in public health and in, in nutrition, but I actually started writing some years ago, I started writing some recipe books because people kept saying, oh, that, that'll taste horrible. It'll take too long to cook. It'll be expensive. So I thought we need to be positive about all of this. 
we need to always be talking about the future, emphasizing what's what the world is going to be like for our, our children and grandchildren. We need to focus on local and, and global perspectives, not just think that it's only Australia and we need to promote the common good. I just want to quickly run through some of the Lancet things. I'm not going to go through all the bits in this menu, but what they did was they gave a range of, of, of different kinds of foods and there was a, a mid range value as well. And you can see just big variation. So they said, look, you know, for potatoes and starchy vegetables, the range would be naught to hundred grams a day. For milk and cheese and yogurt, naught to 500. Now, so there, was, there were lots of, of bits there. Um, and if you like, you can, you know, change chicken for poultry or for pork or for lamb or for whatever. The quantities were smaller, but if you look at the, the chicken and the pork and the lamb and, and the fish, really, you, you can make up your meals if that's what you want to do. And there was a mid-range value. And they went the, the same thing for the different legumes. Now, I know peanuts are a legume, but uh, they said you can switch those around if you like. There's soy products, there's tree nuts. They put in some palm oil. I'd go for the naught for palm oil, frankly. That was one of the things I really didn't like about it. Um, the other unsaturated oils depends where you are. Um, having spent much of my life researching Mediterranean diets, you're probably going to um, go for the higher levels of the oil. And I'd be recommending some extra virgin olive. I wouldn't like too much lard or tallow, but they said, look, there are some people where they, that's all they've got and different, but you can see there's a range of values. Now, the criticisms came mostly from people who were very keen on low carb diets or keto diets. And they said, look, this diet doesn't meet nutritional needs. And they said, it's all vegan. The world, you know, you're just trying to turn the whole world into vegans. I actually looked at some of the claims that they made. Um, and it was really quite crazy because they they said the low carb people said if you if you leave out all the carbohydrates, um, there's not enough animal foods there to meet your nutritional needs. My question is: Is the low carb diet the best path to way to an adequate diet? And, and in most cases, probably not. Certainly not from a sustainability point of view. Uh, and there's some quite good uh, references you might like to look up for that. Um, Stefan Guayanet uh, has a wonderful website where he, he argues that the points about these diets are quite like his arguments. They also said that the diet lacks a few vitamins. It lacks sodium, potassium, calcium and iron. It doesn't have any omega-3 fatty acids. So I actually did a bit of analysis and looked at what are they claiming here? They assumed the analysis on which these critics base it, and they all quote exactly the same thing, came from a woman called Zoe Harkham in the UK. She only she had to look and analyze this diet using only one type of grain and she picked rice, which is probably one of the lesser nutritional nutritious grains. She used only one fruit, one type of fruit, which was an apple. So she missed you know, the great variety of lots of, of the vitamins. She only used three vegetables, only one type of, of um, dry lentil um, dry beans, which was lentils. And the soy she only had as defatted soy meal. She also assumed that the lacto over, over vegetarians would only choose the mid levels of vegetables and cheese and milk and yogurt. Now, if you're not going to have any animal products, you'd probably go for the higher level of vegetables because otherwise your plate would be half empty and you'd be a bit hungry. Yeah. And she assumed that the vegans would only choose the mid levels of the legumes and the soy foods and the peanuts and the tree nuts. So they were silly assumptions. Yeah. I looked at if you include the om omnivorous choices, um, it, you meet the, the, the uh, recommended dietary intake for vitamins B and A. We don't have an RDI for vitamin K, but we have an adequate intake and it meets that. It meets it for calcium and iron for potassium. It was correct that the diet is low in sodium, but in practice, uh, we'd be very happy if people have a bit less sodium, salt, which is going to be added to breads and other foods. So that was really a silly sort of thing. We don't have an RDI for vitamin D or for omega-3s, and you really only need to spend a very short time in the sun to get adequate amounts of vitamin D. And the omega-3s for the omnivores could come from fish, and of course, they could also come from, from various um, seeds and nuts. If you look at the lacto-ovo-vegetarian choices, again, they meet the RDI for vitamin B12, but only if you choose the upper level of milk and eggs. Um, which you'd assume that if you're going to be a lacto-ovo-vegetarian, you might do that. Uh, they meet the RDIs for most things. So 
it's pretty much the same as one we just looked through. But again, the sodium, they are low, the sodium is low, but it really is not a huge problem. If we go to the vegan choices, then the Eat Lancet diet doesn't meet the RDI for vitamin B12. But if you read the Eat Lancet diet, it advises that if you are a vegan, you need to take a B12 supplement. And I think I would agree with that. And most of the vegan people would agree with that. It also doesn't meet the RDI for calcium. Uh, so you would need to choose calcium fortified foods. So for example, if you're choosing a, a plant-based milk, you need to have one that is fortified with calcium or take a calcium supplement. So it's, it's all doable in other words. Uh, it certainly meets the, the RDIs for vitamin A and iron and the adequate intake for vitamin K and potassium, again, low in salt. So the same sort of, the criticisms really, I think were, were pretty silly. So my take on the critics is that um, I think it's crazy to have an extreme attitude to food and nutrition. Um, any extreme attitude just leads people to sort of break out. One of the problems is that they're often supported because nobody wants any recommendation to sell less of their product. So you have people like we have some of the people from large food companies uh, or the people selling meat or dairy products or eggs or whatever it is don't, don't want less sales of their products. So they've been very critical of this. And you get a strong lobbying of politicians. And I've put a question mark after funding, but there really is no question that the funding goes from some of these people to politicians. Uh, the industry also insists on representing itself on committees, uh, on being represented on any committees that set any sort of guidelines. And that is a real problem because often they have far more power than uh, those of us who just work in public health. The essential messages from the Eat Lancet diet is that there are many healthy ways to eat it does take a global and flexible pers per, per, uh, perspective. The way foods are produced matters. And I think we have to expand our knowledge of that as well. And sustainability will vary in different areas and we mustn't get different food cultures. We cannot expect everyone to eat the same diet. I mean, people in, who've been brought up in some Asian countries are not going to eat the same as people who are brought up in Mediterranean countries. Uh, so we, we need to take respect, have respect for that. That's not too difficult to do. So in asking is Eat Lancet the answer, there's a World Resources Institute report. It's very long, 564 pages. You can look it up, it's free on the internet, but it's a menu of solutions to feed 10 million people by 2050. So it is quite interesting. And they were actually very supportive of Eat Lancet. Uh, that's the cover of it there, creating a sustainable food future. And they, they're saying there are five Five things we need to do that we could help feed nearly 10 million people in ways that help combat, po combat poverty, allow the world to meet their climate goals and reduce pressure on the environment. And that's their menu. We need to decrease the growth in demand for food and other agricultural products by stopping wastage and all those sort of things. We need to increase food production without expanding agricultural land. So we need we need some crop development. So we need the agriculture people sort of um, to, to do that, which they're very happy to do. We need to protect and restore natural ecosystems. We need to increase fish production. They're very keen on fish in the World Resources Institute. And we need to decrease the, the gases from agricultural production. So it's quite an interesting report. And when people criticize the Lancet report, I say, have a look at the World Resources Institute. Um, it's really quite interesting. So my, my plea is let's do it. We can have healthier bodies and a healthier environment. And so we can simultaneously tackle climate change, obesity, and a whole lot of health problems. This is something I've put, you'll notice if you've been looking carefully, all of these things along the bottom of my slide say 2021. This one actually says 1994. Uh, and before that, it was on um, uh, overhead projection sheets for many years. But this is, uh, I've been talking about this for a long while. So I always think the balance that means we have three sides. We have to look at nutrition and health. We have to look at taste and food literacy so people understand food. And we have to have environmental sustainability there. So these are sort of just a really simple way of perhaps explaining it to people. I think I started doing it when people started doing food pyramids and I thought, well, I just have a triangle and that's what mine looks like. The other, just I just want to end by sort of saying that sustainability issues need 
experts from a whole range of different fields. Obviously public health, medicine, but also ecology and the environmental sciences, that the allied health people, including the dietitians, the sociologists, the agriculture and water resources people, we need to involve all of these people. We all need to work together. And we need to do this because we have to convince politicians and by working together it will mean we have to get out of our silos. I think we have to go for all three levels of government. So if we're looking at uh, waste, for example, local government has the, the role there, but we need to go for the federal, obviously, and state. And we need to be quite outspoken about all of this as occurred with tobacco. Now, my um, history goes back to uh, anti-smoking campaigns from the 70s, uh, which I was involved with. Some of you weren't, most of you probably weren't even born then. Um, we need to use social media now. Social media certainly uses it against us and certainly against, well, against me, but you've got to ignore some of those sort of things. And we need to make sure we avoid conflicts of interest. Never give up. Um, persistence, um, I would say, does pay off. So just one last thing. I've been talking about, I used to talk about plant-based diets and I started realizing that that was the best way to be criticized and, and accused of being a vegan. I don't know why people who would never dream of, of saying, making racist comments for somehow some reason think it's perfectly all right to, to be very nasty about people who prefer a vegan diet. And I have friends and relatives who are vegan. So I, I think we have to be quite nice to them. Um, but we need a diet that features healthy plant foods and less processed foods. And maybe the best way to talk about it is a plant rich diet rather than a plant based diet. So if we talk about plant rich, it sort of has a more positive connotation to many people than plant based, which makes them think, oh, I can't have all this sort of stuff. So I like the word rich to go in there. And my final slide, which also is dates from 1997, is the, the interrelation ship that we have to have and see between health and what we eat and protection of land and water and also social equity. So all of these things I really think have to go together. If we have some people who say, I want to eat lots and lots of meat and I don't care if that means there's nothing for you, that to me is the, the way we do not want to go. So we have we have a lot of um, fronts to fight on, but I believe we can do it. And it's it's fantastic when we see people all getting together. So we have lots of groups. Um, Doctors for the Environment is terrific. Uh, I'm involved in Farmers for Climate Action, even though I'm, I'm not a farmer, but I've got some relatives who are and I'm surrounded by them where I live. Um, we've got the Public Health Association. We've got the Dietitians Australia who've now got rid of all of their processed food um, sponsors and uh, avoiding conflict of interest and are passionately interested in sustainable food supplies. So we, we've, we've got a whole lot of people working towards this. We've got the agriculture people. So we need to learn to, to work together. And if you can spread doctors for the environment to many more of your colleagues, that would be a fantastic thing. And I think it's probably time for me to stop talking, so I shall. Oh, look. Thank you, Rosemary. That was such a rich talk. You just covered so many things in there. And, um, you know, I love that you have social equity written on your last slide because, you know, I think one of the things I liked about the Lancet diet is that it, it's trying to make a world where everybody has enough to eat and that, you know, we need, as you say, we need different answers for different communities. Um, I am going to look in the question and answer in a second, um, but before I do, there's a question that I'd like to ask, and that's about one of the things I have when I talk to patients about the Lancet diet is, you know, you show them the plate and there's, you know, about 10% of um, animal of meat and yeah. uh, so, but that's not enough protein or that won't be enough iron for my diet. And so could you respond to that, please? Like, you know, re really about plant-based sources of protein and how women especially can be getting enough iron in their diets in Australia because of the food we eat. Yes, I mean, when we look at the figures for Australia, there's actually no more iron deficiency anemia in people who follow a healthy vegetarian diet than there is in people who eat meat. And that's obviously because it's the loss of iron that's the biggest problem rather than the intake of iron. Um, and people don't realise just how much iron we do get from other foods, foods other than meat. 
um, there's, there's, I mean, in the, in the olden days, anyone who was low in iron was told to, to make sure they ate liver. And we stopped telling people to eat liver a few years ago, simply because we weren't quite sure that the liver was free of some of the, the um, various things that animals were being fed that were undesirable, so that we sort of stopped saying that. But you can actually get enough iron, most people can, but I mean, you, you may have a, a woman with heavy periods or, or she's had a, a, a lot of children um, in, a, in a short period of time who may need some extra iron. But this sort of diet really does supply, it does meet those needs for iron, as long as they don't think a vegetarian diet is one where you eat white bread and jam and, and um, you know, cornflakes. I mean, if you have, you know, you have rolled oats or a decent muesli for breakfast, you can get quite a reasonable supply of iron from a good muesli. Um, that when you're snacking, you snack on things which may provide you with some iron, um, so, some dried fruits or, or nuts, uh, seeds, those sorts of things, rather than lollies. So it is, we do have to talk about a healthy diet with less meat because we have a, I mean, I see a lot of teenage girls who say they're vegetarian and don't eat meat, but they also don't eat vegetables. Yeah. Um, they yeah. sort of have appalling diets. I mean, it's the, you know, the chips, um, the chips, cola and, and uh, cake type diet. And that, that's an unhealthy diet. So we do have to talk about healthy diets with less meat, but there is still, you know, quite a bit of meat there and you can swap those meats around. I think the idea that you only have a tiny little thimble full of meat on the plate is, is not a practical way to eat meat unless, mm -hmm. except when we look at Asians where they might have quite a small amount of meat included in the, in the type of the whole, the whole plate full of food. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise we could have meat some days and not on other days. Yeah, you can sort of save it up, can't you? you yeah, know, you can that's say, right. I'll, I'll have my bit of chicken, you know, on Friday night or, you know, whatever night. And I think that I, that sort of line of reasoning around um, having a healthy diet, um, you know, answers the protein question as well, doesn't it? You know, like if people are eating yeah. legumes, if they're eating seeds and nuts, you know, good quality grains, then they're going to be getting their protein from that anyway. You know, yes. still, you can still, you know, they can still have big muscles at the gym, basically. Yeah. Well, you really can meet the protein requirements. So protein, a lack of protein is, is not something we very often see in Australia unless people are following really, really unhealthy diets full of junk foods. So yeah. you get rid of the junk foods and you make sure that you, your foods are nutritious. And if you have problems, you know, there are dietitians who can actually work this stuff out for people. We'll sit down and go through everything they're eating and give them some meal patterns and, you know, spend an hour at least with them on an initial thing. So we, we often, I think, um, we often find that doctors are happy, medical doctors are happy to use physiotherapists for, for exercise, but not they don't realise that they can also use dietitians to give people much more tailored advice for their specific yeah. lifestyle that fits with what they need to do. Okay. All right. Well, look, thank you. I've got, we've got um, a few questions here, Rosemary. So I'll, I'll start asking them. Um, one's from David Everett. He says, great presentation, Rosemary. So data rich. Is there any data re-cooking skills? In past times, one needed to know how to prepare meals from basic local ingredients, but can current young people do the same? Not trying to copy MasterChef stuff just day to day meal presentation, or is it just my elderly perception of a loss of skill? <laughs> Oh, no, look, there is a huge loss of skill that lots of uh, younger people do not know how to cook. And uh, you find that in, in a great many households, there is no evening meal. Everyone just gets themselves something to eat when they're hungry. Uh, yeah. And a, a few years ago, I did some research into why this was the case. And, it, and this was partly done through the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Program, for, for which I have to admit to a, it certainly doesn't do anything, but I have a conflict of interest in that I was involved in the setting up of, of that program and getting some funding for it. Uh, but in many households, they don't eat an evening meal together, uh, partly because all the cooking is left to one member of the household. And, and I don't mean to be sexist, but it is very often the woman and she gets home late from work and she doesn't really feel like cooking. So yeah. people just get themselves something to, to eat. But the main reason why we found in the bit of research that I was doing 
that they didn't have an evening meal was because the kids complained if they had to eat vegetables until we started the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Program. Once the kids grew the vegetables at school and they ate them at school all together and they cooked them, the whole family was able to eat a meal at night because the children no longer hated vegetables. And in some of the schools in Melbourne, they actually started because they had nice kitchens in the schools, the kids wanted to take their dads, who could, if they had dads who couldn't cook, and many of them did, they started having some evening classes for the dads where the kids taught the dads how to cook the things the kids had, had in school. And the whole family's diet improved. So there, there is a lack of skills. And unfortunately, in many states of Australia, we used to have a subject called home economics, which taught people how to cook. And it was changed to a subject called food technology, uh, where people were taught about how foods were processed, uh, which sort of um, some of us fought against it. I had originally written the textbook for the home economics course for them. I refused to write the one on food technology. Um, but we do need to teach people to, to cook and we need to teach them from quite a young age. Um, yeah. And we need to, they all need to take a turn at it. And if yeah. you don't have to cook every meal, and that means that if you're playing queen of, if I'm talking to women here, sometimes women play queen of the kitchen and have to have everything done their way. You've got to sort of um, give the kids a bit of a chance, you know, and, yeah. and my own when they were young told me that if they were going to cook the meal I had to sort of you know butt out basically and one of my daughters whenever she cooked the other kids would say oh here come all the herbs tonight she always used too many herbs but she turned out to be an excellent cook after we had a, a few yeah. meals that were rather over dominated with mint <laughs> oh well, at least you, you know you've got to try these things don't you um yeah we do well, need but it's true we do need to teach people how to cook and we need to teach our children and certainly, um, as a grandmother, I find it's really good to teach grandchildren how yeah. to cook. Oh, and absolutely. Then... Absolutely, Rosemary. So um, just before we go on to the next question, can I just ask you to stop sharing your screen? Because I think it's oh, yeah. causing a bit of buffering for some people in the audience. Um, and then, if that's okay. okay. Great, here we are. And then the next question I've got is from Anna. Hi, Anna, Seth, how are you going out there? Um, how would you align discussing a planetary health diet with a health at every size approach and its focus on avoiding good, bad dichotomies about food? Okay. Look, I think that is a problem and I understand the health at every size approach, but the health at every size approach uh, really is still talking about, you know, healthy foods. So I think we need to concentrate on that whole idea of having healthy, healthy foods um, and the idea that, I mean, I don't, I, th I, I prefer to talk about foods that, that are uh, foods you, you limit. Um, I mean, we all, I think we all accept the fact that you've got to limit alcohol, for, for example. We need to limit those other foods. I, I don't, I don't, um, there, was a, there was a program that was running called Sugar by Half. I thought that was really a good way to do it. You know, Sugar by Half was not saying you couldn't have any. I don't. I want to tell people to stop eating so much sugar, but I don't want them to, to think they can never have another piece of birthday cake. Yeah, so sure. I think that we have to talk about foods as, as healthy or less healthy, and the less healthy foods, we really do need to just not have quite so many of them. But I, I take the point that you don't want good and bad coming into it all the time. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and be sort of too prescriptive or something. Um, the next question is from Dan Ewald, and it's, maybe a little bit of a um, cheeky one, is our alcoholic brews counted as junk food? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. I mean, officially we call them all discretionary foods. And yeah. if people are active enough, of course, they can, they can fit some discretionary foods in. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's also important because we haven't talked about that, but we could give a whole talk on the need for a less, you know, sedentary, for those people who are not natural born fidgeters like me and never can stop moving. Um, you need to actually program in some physical activity and that gives you the opportunity to, to have a bit more. And once you've had all the healthy stuff, if you're a bit more active, you can you can fit some of those things in. That's it, you know, and so that's, you know, being healthy people, isn't it? You know, realising... Yeah, I mean, you still have to... Yeah, yeah, activities, absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, you still do need to sort of, you know, have a bit of a... a you can't have unlimited alcohol, that would be stupid. So there's nothing you can have in unlimited quantities and some things need to be limited perhaps a bit more than others. All things in moderation, including moderation. I think that's what my dad would have said to that one. 
I'm always worried by all things in moderation because usually said by somebody who's having their sixth chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's used as an excuse. Um, the um, Michael Shine's got a question. The Australian Dietary Guidelines are currently under review. Um, could this be an opportunity to raise the issue of food sustainability? And I think you did touch that on that in your talk, but yeah, could you talk to that please? Uh, absolutely, this is the, the ideal opportunity. We tried very hard, I was on the expert panel for the last dietary guidelines and we tried very hard to have far more about sustainability in those guidelines. And we were delayed in bringing out the guidelines which we were given 18 months to do. And four years later, they eventually came out with minimal stuff, some stuff about sustainability, but far less. And the reason why for that big delay was because there was so much objection to sustainability. And I think that objection has probably gone. So we're very hopeful that um, we will get far more about sustainability into the, into the next dietary guidelines. I know people in the Department of Federal Department of Health think it has to be there. Certainly uh, the Public Health Association, the dietitians, a whole lot, a lot of people are saying we have to address sustainability. So. How, do yeah. we, how would we feed into that though? So who, who are the group that we need to be talking to? Uh, the National Health and Medical Research Council uh, oh, okay. will be in charge of putting it together. So they haven't announced their expert panel, but they do have a website. Uh, and a little while ago, they asked people what were their important issues. So anyone could put in, unfortunately, the, the deadline's gone for that now, but you could put in the things that you thought were important issues to discuss. And I hope lots of people put in sustainability. I know quite a few did. Yeah, I would imagine that there are people on this webinar that have have put their um, opinions forward. On yeah, that. well, I hope so. And so we haven't. We have. They said they put the results up um, on the website, but I look almost every day, and they're not. It's not happening yet. I haven't quite got there. Um, Okay, I've got another question from Brianna Allman. Um, hi, Rosemary. Thank you so much for this fantastic talk. I'm curious with the intake of fish, this may be a myth, but is there any concern about how pollution of our oceans and increased microplastics in marine life may impact on our diets? Well, that's an interesting question. Yeah, look, it is an interesting, it's one I've been wondering about just this last week because we've just had a couple of papers about microplastics and then the amount of microplastics in, in the ocean, which is a, a huge problem. Mm. Um, the whole area, I mean, the, the pollution of the oceans is a huge problem. In general, I guess, if we've got wild caught fish, um, there's likely to be less of a problem than in farm fish. The only thing about farm fish is that we really have a great awareness in the fishing industry of how important it is that farm fish is sustainable. And so there's, there are so many programs now going, being helped along by the CSIRO scientists to not have fish that are farmed by feeding them small fish, which is pretty unsustainable. Um, so they've developed, CSIRO have developed some lupin feeds and various things to give those fish the nutrients they need, but we really are quite far along there. But at least people, there's, there's a lot more um, conscious effort to make sure that farm fish is going to be more sustainable. But yes, it's, it's a question that we haven't really looked at in the past and we will certainly have to look at again. Yeah. I mean, I've had a number of people who say we don't want to eat meat, we have to eat fish all the time. And quite a few people who say I'm vegetarian, except I eat fish. Now I'm now eating seafood three or four or five times a week. And that's not going to be sustainable. Yeah, we need to, look, there's so many good things you can actually cook with, um, well, not just chickpeas, but with a variety of legumes and, and nuts and seeds and grains mm. and lots of different vegetables that, that yeah. we need to emphasize some of those so that they make up delicious meals. Yeah, and I suppose it comes back to what you said in your talk about how um, you know a diet is you know not defining what we're having for dinner by the pro by the meat. You know, so we're having yeah. chicken tonight, or we're having you know steak tonight, or fish tonight. If you're replacing all your land animals with sea animals, you know, surely the emphasis is to say, okay, we're having well, we're having vegetables. You know, we're having legumes, or we're just you know taking the yeah. animal product out of it or something. Um, yeah, I mean, it's fantastic if people have access to a garden and there's a lot of papers showing that if people have access to a garden, whether it's a community garden, a, a home garden or a school garden, that they go and they have a look at what's in the garden. They come in and say, someone says, what are we having for dinner? They look in the basket of what they've just picked. So, you know, it, if we could get people connected with gardens, now 
it's not always practical. I totally understand that lots of people have to work far from home and, you know, they're going to work in the dark, coming home in the dark, and they can't manage the garden. But where we can have access to gardens, that helps to define the meal in a different way. Because people always say, look, I just picked, I just got some beetroot out of the garden, I got this and I got that, and that becomes the centre of the meal. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, maybe that's one of the council actions that we can have is encouraging um, you know, community gardens or, you know, fruit trees in, um, you know, common land and all of that sort of stuff. Well, they tried uh, that in Toronto a few years ago. They had all the street trees as fruit trees. And, mm. and they said the fruit, at first people started pinching them before it was ripe and then they realised that there was enough there for everybody. And so the, those fruit trees are really quite important. Now, you've got to have the right ones for the right um, setting. You don't want trees that are going to, you know, drop things all over the footpath. But a lot of those sort of things are, can be done with local government. And local governments have a whole interest in environmental sustainability because it reduces their a lot of their costs. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, wouldn't they, so to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you your next question, Rosemary, but then I'm going to just, in the chat, I'm going to put in the um, link to the evaluation form for any um, RACGP or ACRA members who might be watching and want to get some um, points for tonight. I also did put a link to that form in the reminder email that attendees got this, got this afternoon, just in case you miss it in the link. Um, but we have a question here, Rosemary, since beef is the most unsustainable type of meat, why are dairy products not considered in the same light considering the effects of cattle farming? So have you got a response to that, please? Uh, well, they are considered that there is a, is a problem if you have too many of them. But in general, um, we're not producing the same quantity as we are. For, so for beef, for example, we produce beef in Australia more for export, as much for export at least, as it is for, for domestic consumption. Whereas although we do export some dairy products and some of us get slightly horrified at, at to people, Australia exporting um, formula, milk formula for, for babies in, in uh, Asian countries, uh, yeah. we, we don't have the same overproduction. We tend to keep dairy cattle in areas where the grass will grow and there's good rainfall and not quite so many of them. But certainly we need to make sure that we don't try and expand that to export lots of dairy products and to have them, we don't have lot feeding for dairy cattle in this country, whereas they do in the United States and many other, and certainly in parts of Europe. But in Australia, most of our dairy cattle are free range cattle. Okay. So it's, they're not, it's not quite the same because that means that they need to be in an environment that is suitable for them. And we don't have the same sort of numbers. And isn't it, I thought that was also because of the land use changing, changes so that you know, a lot of the expansion of the beef industry, there's, um, you know, deforestation and then you've also yeah. got the, um, you know, like, you, you know, your, um, all the water that's required for that. And um, that, you know, if you're growing cattle for beef, then you're going to kill them. But if you're growing them for cattle, then they're going to live for longer and therefore there's less land use change. Some other problems. I mean, in an area, since I live, live well, the people are a couple of kilometres, our neighbours are a couple of kilometres away from us, but they are dairy farmers. And they don't kill all their, their um, boy calves. They, they're they producing those for, for for meat as well. But in some areas they do, you know, and so you really, I'm not going to say all dairy farmers are fantastic because they're obviously not. But in my particular area, they've, they've decided to plant trees and and, and join their, our environment group and sort of look at those sort of things. But then it's a small number, you know, I think we have, in, in the area where I am, they, they used to be sort of 50 dairy farmers and now they're seven. Um, so that they've cut back the numbers to what is appropriate for that area. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we need to do that. Like, no, I, I just happen to be in a particular area. And I'm, I'm not just, I'm certainly not just praising dairy dairy cattle for, because I happen to live next door to dairy farmers. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. You've got to be neighbourly, I think. It's important in life. Yeah. Um, I have this, there's two more questions. One's a second one from Anna, who I am. Um, so Anna, Seth, if you're still listening, I kind of skipped you because you asked too, but I'll go back to you at the end if that's okay. I am aware that it is now um, 8.30 your time, Rosemary. And so, you know, we did say that we'd talk for an hour. So are you happy to continue with a couple more questions or would you, you know, otherwise, you know, thank you so much for what you've done and been here tonight. Um, 
I just I, I just wanted to and people who are listening if you're happy to stay um are you comfortable with that or otherwise yeah, that's fine that's fine thank you um so just two more questions and then one comment so uh, the question is from a1 um what do you think about recommendations for calcium intake on a plant-based diet the current calcium guidelines have input funding by the dairy industry and there's also evidence suggests that dairy isn't the best or most bioavailable source of calcium so uh, look, I disagree with the, the bioavailability of the calcium from, from dairy milk. It is actually very, well, it's much more bioavailable than any other, but it's not the only source of calcium. Dairy, dairy foods are not the only source of calcium. So that we can get adequate calcium in a, in a plant-based diet. It's, it's not all that difficult. Although, um, I, and I agree that the calcium requirements are ridiculously high. Uh, I'm not sure it was necessarily from the dairy industry. I think it was the people, partly from the people who are selling calcium supplements who wanted to be ever higher. But uh, there's, a, there's a fairly strong feeling among many of us that the, the RDI for calcium is a bit absurdly high. Uh, it's quite difficult for people and people in many countries don't meet it and they do not have more osteoporosis or or any of the other problems that we might attribute to that. They don't have, have bone problems. So it prob I would agree that it probably is too high. I would not agree that it is not a good bioavailable source of calcium because it has been, there's quite a number of studies that look at the, the calcium from things like soy, for example, and which is pretty bioavailable, well, more so than other things. But no, the, the calcium from dairy products, you, you don't absorb all of it anyway. So it's, I can't remember the exact figure, but it's 37, 38, 39 or something, but that's higher than most other things, which are in the 20, low 30s. But it is bioavailable, but it, I would agree that um, the RDIs for a lot of things, they always go up. Every time they're revised, they go up. Right. It's very difficult to get <laughs> on to the, to the um, expert panel that looks at it and dominated by people with vested interests. So yeah, yeah great well. problem. Vested interests are always a problem, no matter what, aren't they? Like they're there, they're there everywhere. Um, but yeah, my understanding was that you could get calcium, you know, like seeds and nuts were very good. I thought sesame seeds were a high source of calcium. Well, there was no tahini. Yeah, sesame seeds, are, uh, the, if they've got the hulls on them, the, the calcium is fairly bio unavailable. It's not really very available, but, but certainly almonds are a good source. Um, you get some calcium out of quite a few vegetables. In some vegetables, you've got oxalic acid, which forms calcium oxalate, and so the calcium is, isn't absorbed. But strangely enough, in a lot of the Asian greens, there are very low levels of oxalates. So the calcium from bok choy or something is going to be absorbed much better than the calcium from spinach, which doesn't mean you shouldn't eat spinach because it's a really good source of lots of other things. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you eat a variety, it's really important to have a variety of foods, a variety of seeds and nuts and grains and vegetables and fruits. Yeah. That's why I was annoyed at that analysis of the Eat Lancet diet that only used apples and only used rice. You know, I mean, you're not going to find things are adequate if you don't have a good variety. Oh, absolutely. It's just, you know, like it's, that it was obviously a pretty biased appraisal. And, you know, everything always tells us that we should have a variety of foods. And it just seems quite obvious that we need a variety of foods because each yeah, food's preferably going to produce yeah. something different for us, you know. It's preferably in season and preferably local. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe from your own garden. Maybe that's one of the take home messages trying to encourage us all to garden. And the last question I have is um, how do we, again from Anna, how do we avoid exacerbating health inequalities given the expense and scarce availability of fresh, local, seasonal foods in some parts of Australia, yeah. for example, remote Indigenous communities? Yeah. And of course, that's a, that's a very difficult question to answer, but. Um, yeah, I think it's a fair point. It's a very good question. And if you look up some of the research that's being done by Amanda Lee, Professor Amanda Lee, who goes out into these communities. In fact, she's just come back from a, a big trip around to try and do something about the foods that are sold in those stores. But yes, it, that's a very valid question for people in remote communities, because frankly, the fresh vegetables and things are incredibly expensive. Now there are um, obviously some bush foods that, that are available and but very often people are not in a position to go and find them because they're not you know just absolutely everywhere. 
Yeah. It's interesting that if we look at an urban population in Australia, what is recommended as a healthy diet actually costs less than what the average people, average person spends on foods because so much of the diet is junk food. So if you cut those out, you've got a whole lot more money for things. But it is also true that if you're looking for a quick snack, the junk food will be cheaper. So the but um, you know the, the fast fast foods are much cheaper than restaurant foods. Uh, but they're not cheaper than what you cook at home. Absolutely. Uh, so in an urban situation, the healthy diet is not more expensive, but there is that huge problem of remote people in remote communities where there just isn't the availability. And we really need to appeal to the, to the big people and the people who supply those foods that they, they've got their refrigerated trucks and things and they bring them in at a much better and sub subsidised price. And that's something that Amanda Lee has been working on for some time and, and with some success. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in many of those spaces, the fridges are supplied by uh, the, the makers of particular brands of soft drinks. And if you don't stock them all with lots of their soft drinks, they won't let you put anything else in them either. <laughs> it's, um, yes, it's, Look, it's, it's a fight. It's a fight. You've got to... <laughs> yeah, it's a very hard one. Um, and the last thing I have, um, we had a, a, an attendee, Graham Dennison, who's asked if he can talk. And I've not done this before, so I have to just press a button that I haven't used before. So, Graham, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Graham. Just briefly, thank okay. you very much, Rosemary. It was an outstanding uh, the way you addressed this terribly important subject. The only thing I am critical of is that, like DEA itself, you are guilty of what is known in medical practice as empirical treatment. Treating the symptom, environmental degradation, instead of the cause, homo sapiens. You very correctly uh, mentioned that population is, uh, has driven most of what you've talked about, but surely, like DEA itself, we must address overpopulation. Okay, number so, one. Um, I'm going to cut you off there. Um, I think you know the, the 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 concept of population growth and Homo sapiens is who makes those decisions. And um, you know, DEA has released a position statement about this, and it's a, you know it's an ex rather um, hard question to expect our panelists to answer. All right. So look, thank you very much, Rosemary, for um, you know joining us all here tonight. And look, I thought that was a wonderful talk. What I really found so inspiring was the way you covered so many different parts of climate and, and um, nutrition and diet and how they all interplay. And um, especially the concepts of packaging and waste mm -hmm. and that, you know, we talk about what we eat, but that, you know, David Attenborough said that, you know, if you do nothing else, don't waste. Yes. And, um, you know, we are such a wasteful society. And, um, yeah, so, look, I really do thank you very much for um, taking the time. And I'm sure that everybody else who's here is um, um, clacking in their own lounge rooms out there, not that we can hear them. <laughs> All right. Look, thank you, everybody, for coming. Our next talk is on the 17th of June, and it's Dr Chris Barnden, who is an obstetrician from Tasmania talking about women's health in, um, in relation to the climate crisis and um, will be a very e excellent um, presentation. All right, Rosemary, have you got any last things you'd like to say to us? Or uh, no, I mean, I, I, I do try to live this life. I was, as I've mentioned to you before, I, 27 years ago, we decided to go off grid. We lived off grid. We don't have a garbage collection. We don't have a garbage can. Uh, we recycle things, we watch out for the way. So I, I kind of try to live it, um, but I do occasionally like an ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. All right, look, thank you so much, Rosemary, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to come along this evening. All right. Thank you. All right, bye-bye, everybody. And I'll just see...